you. Thank you very much. Uh, 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 Professor Banning uh, did not acknowledge, for, for reasons that escape me entirely, the fact that um, he and I were guides together uh, in the parliamentary precinct uh, in the summer of 1966. Uh, so that's a long friendship and uh, a, a, lo a long uh, uh, relationship. Uh, and uh, my favorite question that I was asked when, <laughs> when I was a guide was, how much does the building weigh? Uh, which I thought was like a truly ridiculous question. And of course I said, you know, with or without the furniture. <laughs> And uh, they said, well, what do you mean you know? Of course, I absolutely know. I've you know, got the exact answer here in my pocket. Uh, I made up some number. I can't remember. But anyway, just a, a lot of fun. Um, well, I, I hope we can have a, 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 a relatively dynamic exchange. Um, it's good to be back at Queen's. I was here uh, not too long ago to give a, a talk on the uh, Rohingya issue and um, uh, its relationship to populism, which is a growing movement we're seeing around the world. And I've had the opportunity to visit here on a number of occasions. Couldn't actually get in as an undergraduate. Um, but um, I, uh, I did receive an honorary doctorate from Queens, for which I'm very, very grateful. Uh, and I've had a long relationship with this school and with its many uh, leaders and, uh, and graduates. And I'm delighted to be, uh, to be invited back and have an opportunity to share some some time and some thoughts with, uh, with all of you. Uh, before I get into my anecdotage about you know, what happens and how does it all work and everything, which I think is, is kind of fun and interesting, uh, at least I think it is, and my kids say, well, yeah, but that doesn't necessarily mean that everybody else thinks it is, but uh, uh, it's important to, to realize and remember that in, in our first past the post system, um, uh, historically, uh, when there was a two-party system uh, between 1867 and 1921, uh, there, there were no minority parliaments. You either voted conservative or liberal, uh, and you, know, you could pretty well predict, depending on the leader or, or depending on your religion or where you lived in a particular part of the country as to how your inclination would be, what your inclination would be in voting. Uh, but that stable situation began to um, really fritter away uh, in, uh, in, the, in the early 1900s <coughs> with the emergence of a, uh, a party in Quebec that was led by Henri Bourassa, which was very much dedicated to a, a different vision and a different expression of the Quebec personality. We then went into the war uh, and... Uh, uh, Sir Robert Borden uh, invited uh, Sir Wilfrid Laurier to join his cabinet in a t completely unusual arrangement, although Lloyd George and company were doing the same thing in the UK, and our eyes were often posed off in that direction. And that had the effect of splitting the Liberal Party because Sir Wilfrid decided that it, he could not do that uh, because he felt that uh, the, the, the issue of the war in Quebec was simply too difficult for him to be able to manage and that if he did that, it would create other problems and other issues. And so he didn't go, but many members of his, of his former cabinet and members of his caucus did go. And that was really a reflection of the beginning of a dramatic change in the country. Um, after the war, um, there was um, the Winnipeg general strike in, in 1919. There was the troops all coming home with horrendous stories of what they had experienced, what they had been through. Many of their families really not fully aware of the nature of that trauma. Uh, certainly Borden was fully aware, fully aware of it, uh, uh, and it was something that, that kept him awake late at night. But uh, that created a whole different political dynamic. Women uh, were given the vote. There was a movement to expand the franchise so that it was much wasn't dependent on property or how much money you had. So there was emergence of a, of a, of a wave that was very different uh, in, uh, in the country. And that led to, uh, in Ontario <laughs> to the first non-Tory, non-conservative government, the farmer labor government, in which Robert Nixon's father was a member. And uh, it led to the Drury government, which many of you would never have heard of. It was sometimes referred to as the 
dreary government, but that's another story. Um, it lasted for a short time, and then they, they were never heard from again. But the progressive movement, as it was called, which was basically a rural-based movement in Western Ontario and, and in Western Canada, came alive in 1921 and elected a whole slew of people who called themselves progressives, capital P, to the Parliament of Canada. And that upset the apple cart in terms of the relationship between uh, the parties. So for the first time, we had a minority government led by Mr. Mackenzie King in 1921. And Mackenzie King did not do a deal with the progressives. And I think what history will show is he basically kind of managed them, kept them happy, and effectively tried to bring them all back into the Liberal Party because he regarded them as kind of liberals who'd somehow gone astray. <coughs> and he very much wanted to bring them back. But the election of the progressives really meant that uh, the, the, the mold was broken in terms of how our party structures would work. And people began to realize that we were not, we were not like England. Uh, we were a highly regional country with many, many different um, features depending on the province, depending on the issues, depending on the, um, the, the conditions in the country. Um, and people began to talk about Western alienation. We talk about it now, but it's over 100 years old, by the way. Uh, grievances based on uh, how those provinces were treated, how they became, they sensed when they were first admitted into the Federation, they became second, they were second class citizens. They did not have control over their resources. There were a lot of things that needed to change in order to, to give those provinces the same powers that all the other provinces had. And of course, they had much less representation in the Senate and so on than those provinces that had been admitted before. So it was a, a whole new uh, set of issues for Canadians, plus the social and political issues arising out of the recession, arising out of the depression. All those things began to come together. A Labour Party grew up, CCF was formed, Regina Manifesto and so on, and you just have a whole new um, set of issues that are facing uh, Parliament. We didn't have another real minority experience. At a brief period in 25, 26, when King was so-called defeated, won less seats than, than, our, than, than uh, uh, well, he and Meehan had almost the same number of seats, and they wasn't clear who was going to be able to form the government. King went in to see the Governor General and said, I would like to uh, uh, form the government, and and when the government was defeated, he went back to see the Governor General and said, I'd like to call an election. And the Governor General said, no. And the Governor General was quite a famous character in Canadian history. He was a British general who led our troops at Vimy and was a bit of a hero to the veterans. And uh, Lord Bing said, no. Uh, I'm going to ask Mr. Meehan if he can form the government. And in those days, when you were asked to form a government and you appointed people to the cabinet, you had to resign and there was a by-election. So, of course, it was like a poison chalice. You can form a government, that's the good news. Bad news is all your ministers have to resign. Hey, guess what? <laughs> Mackenzie King could count. And he said, well, you know, we're, we're going to end up defeating you anyway. So that's what happened. And there was an election and King was re-elected. And it was co the famous called the King-Bing election because King turned it into an election about who is this foreigner, this representative of the crown, telling us Canadians who can form our governments. Now, I'll come back to that example in a minute, because the, the long and short of it is Bing was actually right and King was wrong. Uh, if you look at the constitutional theory behind what, uh, what uh, Bing was doing, he was acting completely appropriately, and he was doing exactly the right thing. And I'll come back to that when we look at some of the other issues around minorities more, more recently, because that example is still uh, ver very much uh, with us in terms of uh, Canadian politics. We didn't have another uh, minority uh, election until 1957, uh, when the, the San government was defeated, or that's to say the conser Conservatives for, you know, had, more, had more seats, and then Mr. Diefenbaker governed briefly in the minority, and then uh, the Liberals kept pushing for an election. And Diefenbaker could also count, but in a different way. There were these modern things called polls. And all of his advisors said, 
look, if they really want to keep on pushing you to have an election, uh, let's have an election. <laughs> and we're going to beat the pants off them, which is what happened. Diefenbaker won the largest majority in Canadian history up to that time uh, and uh, was, you know, won seats all across the country, including in Quebec. Uh, out of a house of 265 members, he won 208 seats. I'm looking at these numbers and I'm looking at Peter Milliken because he's the one guy who burns Hansard at both ends and would know these, know these, these facts better than me. So I'm going by memory, but I believe I'm correct in giving you those numbers. <coughs> so, Pearson comes back, the minority, another minority government in 62, Diefenbaker, challenges, problems, uh, Diefenbaker is defeated, another election, 63, Mr. Pearson, just short of a majority, he had what pundits, ill-informed pundits refer to as a strong minority, <coughs> and the reason I say that is there's no such thing, right? There's no such thing as a strong minority. You either have a majority or you have a minority. It doesn't matter if you're short by one. Mr. McGinty was short by one, and he called me up the next day. <coughs> well, actually, I called him to congratulate him. And he said, well, <coughs> we, we have a strong minority. And I said, Premier, with the greatest of respect, there is no such thing. And I told him the story, which I might as well tell you now, which is, of course, when Joe Clark held his first press conference as, at his election uh, in 1970. Uh, 79, he's fam fam 19 yeah, 1979, he's famous for having said, uh, I'm going to govern as if I have a majority. Um, which I've always thought is sort of like saying, jumping out of a plane and saying, I'm jumping out of this plane <coughs> as if I have a parachute. <coughs> you better have a parachute. Because it, it's a real problem if you don't. And, and as it turned out, you know, he, he didn't. We went through, uh, the Pearson government was uh, frustrated because they did not have a majority. He called another election in 1965, uh, thinking he could get one. His advisor said, looks good, polls are there, we think you can get a majority. Didn't get it. Came back again until 68, and then Mr. Trudeau won his majority. Trudeau goes into a minority in 72 to 74. The NDP holds a balance of power in that situation. Again, um, no formal arrangement, no uh, real deal, but a series of kind of maneuvers that the Liberals and, and NDP agreed sort of informally to. Uh, and then, of course, eventually parties sort of say, well, it's very difficult, it's very embarrassing to, the governing party feels it's very embarrassing not to have a majority. And the other parties feel they're being squeezed and it puts pressure on them all the time. They don't like the pressure. And so they just say, let's just go for it and have an election. So the reason I have to give you this short history is because we have a, a mixed experience um, in, uh, in Canadian politics. In many other countries which have proportional representation, um, the formation of a minority government is a regular event. All governments are minority governments. And in that situation, it's not unusual for governments to be coalitions, to say, well, we want to have stability, we're going to have different people in the cabinet, we're going to have full executive sharing of the executive, as well as a sharing of parliament. There has really been no uh, real example of that in, in Canada. Mackenzie King kind of had an informal kind of arrangement with the progressives, but the progressives were very reluctant to kind of, quote, get into bed with the liberal majority, because they felt it was somehow tainted. And the language around coalition in Canada is, is always a language that sort of looks at this as a slightly corrupt arrangement, uh, where you're, you know, you're losing your, your identity, and you're, if, you're a, if you're coming from the left, it's difficult. If you're coming from the right, it's difficult, and you don't want to be involved with these big corrupt parties in the center. So we, will, we might support you on a daily basis, but no coalition. Now that debate has evolved a bit, um, and this is where I, I go from giving you a little bit of a history to a little bit of saying, well, this is where I came in. Because in Ontario in 75 and 77, of course, there was an experience. Mr. Davis was put in a, a minority position, didn't like it, tried to get a, a, a majority, didn't get it the second time, 
and then said, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to govern as if I have a minority. And he did. And he governed very, very effectively. And then eventually he went for the majority and he got it. But by the time I, I had two experiences that are, I think, maybe relevant. The first one is when I was first, uh, the first general election I was involved in was the election that Mr. Clark had the most seats, very close to a, a majority. Uh, and Mr. Trudeau didn't want to sort of play the King Bing game. He just, he just resigned as, as Prime Minister. He offered his resignation the next day. Prime Minister, the Governor General called on Mr. Clark to form a government. He formed a government. And then he held his famous press conference. And watching the Clark government in action as a, as a relatively, as a newly elected member sitting fairly far back in the, in the, uh, in the corner of the House of Commons, uh, it was really interesting to watch because they, it was very difficult for the Conservatives to embrace the idea that they had a minority that required them to talk to the other parties. Um, and they thought, well, we don't have to worry about that. Mr. Trudeau is likely going to resign. And when he resigns, that's likely it kind of thing. And the Liberals will be busy, you know, electing a new leader. And we don't have to worry about any of that stuff. The NDP, they'll be, you know, strident. And we had a new, younger caucus coming in and while feeling our oats. And so we, we all, everybody in the game had a different assumption. We assumed, like the Conservatives, that Mr. Trudeau was gone, because he announced he took his famous walk in the snow, and he, he left. Uh, he, you know, he announced his retirement. There, John Turner and, and Donald McDonald were out getting their election campaigns going. They were all organized, ready to go. And bingo, a budget comes down in December. Trudeau, Mr. Trudeau had announced his retirement in early December, or late November, and it was you know, it was, it was sort of the middle of December, and the, this was Mr. Crosby's first budget. And he brought in, <laughs> it, it now sounds ridiculous, as a conservative, he brought in a major increase in the gas tax. And it was a carbon tax, excuse me, it was a carbon tax. And he did it for um, environmental reasons, and he had all kinds of explanations as to why he did it, and why it was fairer, and he had other things he wanted to do. But of course, at that time in, in our lives, raising the gas tax was a hugely unpopular measure. So it was taken for granted that, that the New Democrats would have to craft a motion that would defeat the government. But we had a choice in our caucus. We had a debate in our caucus that I can now reveal. <laughs> uh, the, the debate was, do we have what we used to call a Regina Manifesto addition on to the, to the uh, motion of, 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 of confidence? Or do we craft it in such a way that we know the Liberals will have to support it? And we decided that we would craft it in such a way that the Liberals would have to support it so that it would sort of look funny on the Liberals to not be voting in favor of it. And we thought we'd play that sort of routine, right? Meanwhile, there was a small group of creditees from Quebec uh, who were waiting for the call from the Conservatives. And the call would be, you know, we're going to get this, you're going to have that, there's some things we want to do. And the call never came. So slowly but surely, as we began to, you know, Parliament went on through a few days of debate and, you know, maneuvering around these motions, it was quite weird because the liberals were just smiling and saying, well, we're, there has to be an election, there'll be an election. And people would say, well, we don't have a leader. And they'd say, well, Mr. Trudeau is still the leader. He hasn't left the building. He's announced his retirement, but he, but he hasn't, hasn't gone. And I know this, from another movie, I know this fact. Because the house leader of the, of the liberals was Mr. McKechn, who became a dear friend of mine. And Alan told me a great story where he said he phoned up, the, went to see the Prime Minister <coughs> with Jean Chrétien, and they were in to see him, and they said, look, you have to stay, and you have to, you have to lead us, and we're gonna, we're gonna we can defeat them. 
And Trudeau said, look, I've already announced, you know, I'm really not sure I want to do this. And I said, no, you've got to do it. You have no choice. You can't leave. He said, well, I really want, I've announced my retirement. I've, people have, you know, I've got all the accolades, the editorials have all been written. It's done. I'm out. I'm gone. He said, no, no, you have to. And they said, we're, on the night of the vote, which was, a, you know, I can't remember the date, but it was in December. I should have these dates, like, marked in my head, but I don't. He, <laughs> the deal was that Mr. Kretchen and Mr. McKechn would be sitting by the phone in the opposition lobby, and they gave them the number of that phone in the lobby where they would be sitting, and they said, if you phone us at 9 o'clock to tell us that, that you're not going to run, we'll, get, we'll, we'll send some people home. People will be sick, and they're not going to come in, and a couple of guys were, were really not well, and they dragged them all, we were going to drag them all in, and they were waiting by the phone for the phone to ring. And the phone never rang. And Mr. Trudeau walked into the opposition lobby and says, let's go. So they had to, you know, get everybody organized. And at that point, Mark Lalonde said to me, you know, because he, he used to call me Junior. Uh, Mr. Trudeau also called me Junior. I don't know what it was. It must have been. I was very youthful at that point. Was, <laughs> I know it's very hard for you to imagine such a thing. Um, and he said, Junior, what's happening? And I said, what do you mean what's happening? I said, I think if you guys are all here, we're to, the, the government is going to be defeated. And he said, is, is that really what we all want to do? And I said, well, Mark, have you read The Guns of August? <laughs> and he said, yes, I have read The Guns of August. Great book. I said, yeah. Well, Archduke Ferdinand has just been shot. <laughs> and all these events are just inexorably happening. And unless somebody's done a deal with uh, Fabien Roy, the head of the creditiste, I said, it's done. And that's exactly what happened. So why do I tell this story at such great length? Because what that experience meant to me personally was that in a minority situation, and I'd had a lot of conversations with the MPs from the NDP who'd been in the House between 72 and 74, and to a person, they hated the experience. Everybody talks about how wonderful that period was. We got Petro-Canada, we got all these things. And they said, yeah, but we weren't in government, and there was no stability, and the pressure was on us every week. The press were outside our caucus room saying, well, are you going to pull the plug? Are you going to be a real man today? Are you going to be really up there? Are you going to be, you're going to do this? And they said, no, 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 we're not, you know, we, we can't, we're going to see what we can get. And they, and they felt compromised, but they also felt the pressure, and they hated it. Well, that was one lesson. The second lesson was what I call the, the rule of unintended consequences. We assume when political actors do something, they know what they're doing. <laughs> and that is wrong. They don't know what they're doing necessarily. By that I don't mean they don't know what they're doing. I'm lifting up my hand. But they don't know the consequences of what they're doing because they can't predict what other people are going to do. So there are always going to be consequences of their behavior that they don't know. Jagmeet Singh, when he announced yesterday to say, oh, I might not support the throne speech, my reaction was, are you kidding me? Like, what are you thinking? You know, you, you, you bluff your way into oblivion because you don't, you're not quite sure. If you say, well, I don't know what we're going to Somebody else says, well, I don't know. What, well, you know. And then you've, all of a sudden, you've, you've, you've done it. You pulled the plug without even knowing that you pulled the plug. And that's a big mistake. So when the time came in 1985 for that, that suddenly there was an election result where Mr. Miller won 50-odd seats, Mr. Peterson won 40-odd seats, and I won 20-odd seats. My seats were odder than their, anybody else's, but anyway. Um, <laughs> that's a joke. That's, 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 that's. The night, of the, the night of the election, the pundits all said, Miller wins, wins. Miller wins. He won, he won the most seats, so he's won. And uh, I kept saying to people, it was a Thursday night, I kept saying to people, yeah, we got through the night okay, you know, because you know, nobody was, and I hadn't, wasn't going to you know, show my hand because I didn't know what my hand was exactly. But what I knew was this. We'd had conservative governments in Ontario for 42 years. You know, when I, when I was growing up in Ontario, you knew that the conservatives were going to win. 
Uh, you knew that the Montreal Canadiens would probably win the Stanley Cup. Uh, you, you knew that South Africa would always have apartheid. And you knew that there would always be uh, a communist system in the Soviet Union and that the, the world would be divided between, quote, the free world and the, quote, communist world. Those are all certainties. And suddenly I felt, well, you know, here's one less certainty. Uh, and as you might detect, you know, people say, well, there's really no thread to your political thinking. You know, you've been in two parties. Yeah, only two. <laughs> not three. I'm not a conservative. That's a consistent theme of my political life. <laughs> I'm not a conservative. And so when, when I began to think about it, I said, you know what? Uh, w w it, there's another arrangement that's entirely possible based on this unique mathematical situation. We actually have the leverage to do a different kind of deal with uh, the party who wants to be in power. And we don't have to tip our hand at the beginning. We can say, um, you know, we're, we're ready to talk to both parties, which the press said, what do you mean? I said, we're ready to talk to both parties. Sunday night, I got a call from uh, Herschel Ezrin, who was a classmate of mine at University College, and a good friend, and Herschel said, uh, would you take a call from Mr. Peterson? I said, you betcha. Absolutely. I'm at home. David calls up and says, uh, well, what do you think? It was close, wasn't it? I said, you don't know how close it still is. It's not over. He said, what do you mean? I said, well, if, if you and I can talk through this issue together and we can manage our way through it, you will become the premier and we will have a new, a new government w w with a different approach to things. And he said, well, let me think about it. I don't know if our guys want to do that. I said, fine. We'll talk about it. I don't know whether my people will want to do it either. At the same time, of course, the conservatives were all over us. I've never been so beloved by, by uh, conservatives. <laughs> Frank Miller was phoning, and you know, Bob Elgie was phoning, Mr. Davis was phoning to say, you know, well, you're not going to do anything really stupid, are you? I said, well, you know, <laughs> you never know. It's happened before. <laughs> and our caucus began thinking it through. We had a very intense debate inside the party, inside our caucus. What do we do? Some people wanted to do it the way it had been done with Davis, to say the conservatives are there, they're going to do most of what we want them to do, we we're in a very strong position, let's just play that hand out. And I personally was not keen on doing that, and I made it clear, and also indicated to the caucus that I thought we should be talking about a new political arrangement, and that brought in the whole coalition word. And of course, for the New Democrats, coalition is like um, the union joining management. It's like, we don't, do, we don't do that. You know, we don't do that kind of thing, you know. Uh, you know no, no, we're not going to do that. So that was, a, you know, was not, they weren't ready for that. But I said, well, how about if we did a deal where we got all of the things that we wanted to do and the liberals wanted to do and we'd been in opposition together for 42 years. So we kind of had a sense of what that would be. Let's, let's write that out. So we, we, we started putting it together. And we, we got our team together and say, OK, what have they agreed to do? What can we agree to do? How can we push this along? And we had a set of negotiations with them. But we still had a set of negotiations going with the conservatives, although they weren't very happy because they knew we were talking to the other guys. So I remember Mike Bria, who uh, was a member for Oshawa, was on our team that was talking to the conservatives. And he came back, Bob Linton will know this, and we were sitting around. And I wasn't in the negotiations. I wanted to kind of take a step back and you know, not be directly there, but kind of listen to what people were saying. And uh, I said, well, what are the conservatives prepared to do? And Mike says, it's a candy store, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> what do you want? And I said, oh, this is getting, you know, <laughs> this is kind of awful. You know, this is a little. so we said, no, no, we, we, we've got to do the right thing, in my opinion, the right thing, and effect a change. So I went down to see the lieutenant governor. Caucus all agreed, uh, and I knew the direction we were going. And I went to the lieutenant governor, and I said, sir, John Aird, lovely man. And uh, he, he, I said, look, uh, I want you to know that uh, it's entirely possible 
that we will vote non-confidence in the Conservative government. Uh, but I also want you to be aware that we are talking to the Liberal Party uh, and we, we are intending to create a, a completely stable alternative to the Conservative government. So if, if Mr. Miller comes in and says, we've been defeated, I want, I want another I want an election, uh, I want you to be aware of this alternative arrangement. And he looked at me and he said, man, are you ever putting me on the spot? I said, well, you know, it's, uh, we'll make it, do as much as we can to get the back. We called, we had an opinions from Eugene Forsey, who wrote the book on Bing King. And when I phoned him up and said, you know, is this okay? Is this, is this constitutional in your opinion? And he said, this is constitutional. If you knew Eugene Forsey, he spoke very precisely. In every respect. I said, oh. <laughs> That's good. Are, we, are you prepared to put that in a letter? He said, absolutely. <laughs> okay, good. So it was a great controversy. Why is it a controversy? Because the press, and to a certain extent, many Canadians and, and many political leaders say, what happened on election night is what determines the result of the election. Mr. Harper used to say, I won the election. And you say, no, that's not, that's not how our system works. Our system is not about electing a government. Our system is about electing a parliament. And we elect a parliament, and that parliament, in effect, chooses the next government. Because the, the lieutenant governor asks a person, it can be anybody, it can be anybody, if, who, who he thinks or she thinks is going to be able to form a government that's going to be stable. That's actually the theory of parliamentary democracy that actually exists. So those people who say, well, I won on election night, or I won more votes than the others, doesn't matter. I know it's a harsh thing to say, but that's not how the system works. What works is parliament gets to decide who is going to form the government. And so that's effectively what we did. We signed an accord with the Liberals. It wasn't a coalition. We were not in the executive, but it was a written agreement that had some very, I think, smart features. First of all, it allowed us to say, well, here's the agenda that you're following that we actually wrote with you. So I would be walking around the province for two years, waving the accord and checking things off at public meetings and saying, we got this, we got this, we got this. Plus, we said, we will vote confidence for two years, but confidence has to be restricted. You can't just pull a confidence vote out of the air. It's got to be restricted to matters of supply, and we can vote against you on any other bill, and you can be defeated. And they were. And if the first time it happened, everybody went, whoa, 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 whoa. I said, no, we got the accord. Don't worry about it. It's all, it's all taken care of, all planned for. It's all good. And slowly but surely, the media started to say, OK, we, we kind of see how this is going to work. And then, of course, the next election, Mr. Peterson won a huge majority in 1987. We snuck up and became the official opposition, which doesn't really matter to anybody except the leader of the official opposition who gets to have a new title, uh, but no bigger car and, or anything like that, and no house, you know, as we do in Ottawa. But the point that I was trying to make was this. If the public associates minority governments with instability, as a third party, we will always be going into an election saying, well, we'd like to vote for you, Mr. Ray, but we really can't because you're just going to throw the apple cart and you're going to come outside and make speeches and then you're going to bring the house down. We don't want to do that. I said, well, then we need to build another, another bus. We need to build another way to do this. So that's what the accord was intended to do. It was the product of a particular time in history and it was the product of a particular set of experiences. And sometimes people say to me, well, should this be an accord or should that be an accord? Well, in this particular parliament, for example, my answer was no, not necessarily, because actually um, Mr. Singh doesn't have all the leverage. Um, he's the leader of the fourth party. And there are other parties with which the liberals may decide to reach agreements on certain kinds of policy. And there are other kinds of policy they may decide to work with others. It does create a certain dynamic 
who are you dancing with this week uh, and who are you dancing with next week and it may, it may create problems of morale and all the other issues that are associated with it, but it's a perfectly plausible way to do it. And remember, when Mr. Pearson had his minorities between 1963 and 1968, he passed the Canada Pension Plan, he passed the new Immigration Act, he got us a new flag, uh, he brought in the Medicare legislation, which was eventually finally passed by Mr. Trudeau. But there were a lot of major, major things which took place. Probably the most progressive series of changes in a five-year period that any government's been able to make, and it was a minority government. And the only source of the instability was actually the Liberals' desire to say, let's take advantage of this and have another election. They, he could have lasted for, for that whole five years without an election. He didn't, he didn't gain anything in, in making the change. So a couple of things I would, I would say just about where we are and then time for questions. The first one is, there's a lot of talk about PR, and actually I'm in favor of some kind of PR that provides for some ability uh, in provinces for additional seats to be created that would allow for uh, representation based on the vote in that province. My reason for that is very simple. It, our current system creates an artificial sense of the fact that, quote, there are no liberals in Alberta, or there are no liberals in Saskatchewan, or there are no conservatives in Prince Edward Island, or wherever, wherever it may be. And you say, well, actually, there are a lot. They just didn't manage to elect a, an MP. And there are many jurisdictions, Germany probably the chief, chief one, where the Germans have a system where you have some members elected uh, according to their constituencies and some additional members are elected by virtue of, uh, of uh, the proportional representation. It's not a perfect form of PR. It's not the Israeli form of PR, which sometimes people say, oh, if we have this PR, we're going to have that kind of a system. No, you can, you, this is not, <laughs> Not necessary. You can, you can create a system which is actually more flexible and which allows for that. Um, I, I am one of those people who believes that um, as difficult as they are to manage from time to time, minority governments are not bad. Uh, they uh, are not good. Uh, they are simply an expression of uh, the opinion of that moment and it's, there's nothing wrong with that being reflected in our parliament and it actually does require to be successful, I hope the, somebody's listening to this program as I talk to the camera, <laughs> but it requires a certain kind of discipline and a certain kind of attitude on the part of everyone. Coming out of this election, I don't know, how many of you watched the election night? Just about everyone, that's good, good, good. Most of you were asleep probably at the very end, I would hope, or maybe at some other kind of party, I have no idea what's going on. <laughs> The, the problem was the, the, the night, election night showed what's wrong, with our elect what's wrong with our political system. They all come out and said, I won. <laughs> and you sort of say, as a kid watching this would say, well, you can't all have won. Like, not everybody could have won. Somebody won, yeah, but you didn't win as much as someone else. So that was the first problem. Oh, the, the first problem was they couldn't even agree on what order were they going to speak, which was crazy, right? They were, so they were all talking all over each other. And, and, you know, you got to say, look, you, you have to play the cards you've been dealt. You can't play somebody else's cards. You play your own cards. And the Liberals won the most seats. Uh, they, there was going to be this question that Mr. Shear kept pointing out. Well, if, if I win the most seats, uh, then Mr. Trudeau can't form the government. And that was Mr. Shear is following on from Mr. Harper, right? say the same thing. And the, the it, it's not true. I mean, what Mr. Shear was saying is not right. The, the, the Governor General could ask Mr. Trudeau, are you resigning, sir? He said, no, I'm not resigning. I want to be given a chance to form the government. And probably the LG would have said, the Governor General would have said, okay, I'll give you a chance. But Mr. Shear would have been free to go around and talk to the others and say, really? Is this what you want to do? You want to leave these guys, these arrogant corrupt bunch of people, do you want to leave them in power, or do you want to form a new arrangement with us? So it would have, could have happened, you know, you don't know. But the fact is Mr. Trudeau has the chance to form the government, and Mr. Trudeau 
right to do that has not been challenged. Although Andrew Scheer still doesn't refer to him as the Prime Minister. He calls him Justin or he calls him Trudeau, which I think is, you know, not a good idea. At some point you say, he is the Prime Minister. You're the leader of the opposition. Oh, and you're the leader of the third party, you're the leader of the fourth party, and you're the Green Party with three members, and you're an independent. And everybody who's, everybody who's in that position, they all think, I've won, I've got the leverage. You say, not necessarily. You may or may not have it. So try to figure out how to use what you have to do what it is you really want to do and create the results that you want. Will it be unstable? Not necessarily. Uh, will it be stable? A lot, of, a lot of journalists are saying, it's a stable minority. And you should say, not necessarily. Not if people keep acting as if they won or think that there's some temporary advantage to be gained by, by pushing the envelope further than, in fact, the envelope can, can stand it. So it really depends on whether the parties have the discipline and the maturity to say, we're ready to, we've, we've, been, we've all been, we haven't all won, we've actually all been humbled, we've all been, not humiliated, but humbled. We've all been affected by uh, the result. We know that we did not get everything we wanted and therefore, we need to work with other parties. We need to figure out how to, how to do this. And, and this whole attitude thing is so, so important on the part of all the, all the parties because it really is what will affect it. Let me give a couple of examples. One of the keys to Mr. Davis's minority in 19, from 1975 to 1981 was the fact that he had a very close relationship on a one-to-one -one basis with the leader of the New Democratic Party, Mr. Lewis. And similarly, there were other members of it. He didn't have a deep affection for Mr. Nixon. And he didn't, I mean, you know, so, but there were other ways of talking to the other parties. He had other people who were out there talking to the others. So there was always somebody talking to either a liberal or a new Democrat and trying to figure out how to create that chemistry. Back in the 60s, Mr. Pearson and Mr. Douglas, they weren't buddy-buddy, but they respected each other. They didn't call each other names. They respected each other. And uh, Mr. McKechn had a very close relationship with, uh, with Mr. Lewis, and so did Mr. Trudeau. They knew each other from Montreal. They connected with one another. David Peterson and I knew each other from university days, and we, you know, we, we'd known each other. And the fact that I beat him in 1990 um, doesn't make me the most popular name in the Peterson household, but, you know, you, you have relationships. You develop relationships. One of the great problems in Parliament today is that it, people do not have the kind of relationships that they need to have. I noticed that as soon as I went back into the House in 2008 after I'd been away for a short 25-year gap. And I went back in and it was, it was not good. The atmosphere was not good. You'd have people, I remember once going on a trip with a, a parliamentary trip to Geneva uh, and the Conservative uh, I, guy was there, and I didn't really know him very well, and his wife was with him. I said, why don't you and your wife join us for dinner tonight? We're, we're going to go out for dinner. Arlene and I are going for dinner. And he said, I'm really sorry I can't. I said, oh, I'm sorry you're busy. What, you know, what, what are you up to? He said, no, I'm sorry I can't, I can't go. So about 6 o'clock, he phoned me back, and he said, are you still free for dinner? I said, absolutely. We're just going out by ourselves. It would be great to be with you. And he confessed at dinner that the whips had told him do not go out for dinner with Bob Ray. <laughs> like, don't fraternize with the enemy. He'll seduce you in some weird way. <laughs> and of course, we did. Like, what happened was we got to know each other, and we discovered that we had many things in common, and we discovered <laughs> funny things and very sad and tragic things that we'd been involved with as people. And we, we just became human. We, we were connected to each other. And whenever I would see him afterwards in the House of Commons, I would always go by and I'd say, shh. <laughs> I won't tell anyone. Are you telling him? He said, no, I'm not telling anybody. I won't say who that is, but it, it, it's, a, it's a very fine person. And, and that, you've got to have that in the political system. You absolutely have to have it. People think it's a kind of corruption if you're connecting with members in other parties. It isn't. It's a, re it's a reflection of the fact that you have more in common than you have that divides you. This is not 
uh, you know, the Weimar Republic. We're, we're looking, we should be looking at how we can do things together and respect each other's differences. And that's really what it takes, I think, to make it work. I'm going to stop there. I've gone on a little longer than I should. Happy to take some questions. Okay, well, thank you very much. I gather you've got this, this slide okay. So, so we have a few moments for questions, and what I propose to do is to start with a question from Slido, and then maybe insert one, uh, open up for a question from the audience, and go back and forth. So the first question from Slido, is there any truth to the convention that minority governments get more done than majorities, especially in regard to examples of Medicare and same-sex marriage? Uh, I, don't think it's, I don't think it's a, a rule of thumb. I think it really depends on, on the government. Uh, but it's certainly true to say, and I think I've said this before, that the, the myth that minority governments are inherently unstable and don't ever get anything done is, is not true. You don't have to swip the dial all the way over on the other side and say it's only minorities that get things done. But actually some quite creative things can happen when you have to work together with other, other parties. Okay, a question from the audience. A uh, question here. I think pharmacare will be very much on the, on the agenda. I, I, I think for a whole bunch of reasons. Uh, uh, the Liberals would not have appointed Mr. Hoskin to do the work that he's done if they didn't recognize that it's a big challenge for the country. We, I mean, factually speaking, um, all the older people that you see in this room are heavily medicated. <laughs> okay? I am, for example. Uh, and that reflects, that reflects a fact that is very useful. And that is when Medicare was created, it was limited to hospitals and doctors because hospital and doctors was the big cost. Illness was catastrophic or sudden. You had a heart attack, you broke your leg, you went into the hospital, the doctor fixed it, you left. Well, now we're all, we've all got chronic illnesses. You know, I mean, uh, the, the, the first 20 minutes of any dinner party that I attend is now called the organ recital. What have you got? What have I got? What have you got? What's your problem? What's your issue? So, <laughs> so uh, I'm going to do stand-up after this, actually. <laughs> so it, it's very important to realize that, that the cost of drugs is now built into uh, therapy. It's how, we, it's how we care for people. And for people who are either physically or mentally ill, drugs is a major part of treatment. And it doesn't all take place in hospital by any means. So the role of, of drugs, of, of uh, you know, pharmaceuticals in, in medical treatment has grown exponentially. And we like to think as Canadians, oh, we've solved the riddle of health care. We have universal health care. We don't have universal health care to the extent that we think we do. We don't have drug coverage, we don't have dental coverage, we don't have chiropractic coverage, we don't have a lot of coverage. If you fall down today and you break your arm, and what's the first thing the doctor says? You gotta do therapy. You gotta, you gotta go in and do your exercises. Well, who pays for that? It's not covered by Medicare. So we've gotta look again at Medicare. Mr. Singh talked about this in the election. He was absolutely right. Where I disagree with him was when he said, we're gonna give you free this, free that, free this, and free that. It, it's not free. <laughs> Any Minister of Finance in Ontario will say, it's actually not free, Mr. Ray. It's actually quite expensive. It's a huge part of our tax burden. It's 40% of our provincial taxes go to, health, go, to, go to healthcare. But I do believe that pharmacare is on the table. It's a long answer to a short question. Uh, so Slido, can you speak to the dynamics of floor crossing in minority governments? How real are leaders' fears about losing caucus members? Well, we, um, first of all, I, I want to stress, um, I'm not a floor crosser. Um, I was always elected by the par in the party that I ran for and then stayed in that party through the, through the time. So I, I didn't do it. I don't think floor crossing is that big a deal. Um, we, when I was in minority with Mr. Peterson, we lost a member, Dave Ramsey, who crossed the floor to the Liberals and eventually became the Minister of Agriculture. 
Um, I know that uh, Hazen Argue, who had been the CCF leader in, uh, in, uh, in the Diefenbaker government, ran for the leadership against Mr. Douglas, and he um, uh, became a senator. He was made a senator, so he could be you know, given more, more power and prestige. So yeah, I mean, it happens. Uh, but it doesn't happen that much uh, in my experience. And we shouldn't really spend a whole lot of time worrying about it. Um, actually crossing the floor, uh, David Emerson crossed the floor to become a minister in uh, Mr. Harper's government from British Columbia. Um, and when it, people asked him about it, he said, well, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a, I, I, I've run companies, and I'm not interested in sitting around in opposition. I want to help run the company, so I'm running the company. So he just said, that's where, that's where I want to be. You know, and I, I, I also think that, generally speaking, Canadians are less partisan than they used to be. And they're less um, committed to one party than another. That's what makes elections so exciting, because actually, most voters say, I could vote for any one of them. You know, I could. Or they'll admit privately, I have actually voted another, you know, for another party. Um, and coming out of the NDP, there's a very strong sense that, oh, that's, that's a betrayal. I mean, I still have New Democrats who, when I walk down the street, they'll cross the street so they won't have to say hello. Because they just say, you, you've, you've betrayed us. And it is like uh, a, a, a union president becoming uh, the, the director of labor relations for the company. They say, that's, that's you've betrayed the, the, the class. I have to confess, I was—I never looked at politics that way. I've never seen it uh, in that in that sense. So I—I I, I don't feel, um, and I think that there'll be more of it as time goes on. A uh, question from here. So, yeah. Sure. Uh, based on your uh, experience in the political uh, arena, how do you see the Canadian uh, uh, politic uh, landscape? in the next five and ten years. And I'm, I'm asking that because of the uh, impact of the populist movement coming in, uh, the social media, and perhaps some of the fake news that's coming out. Yeah, well, the, the, I can give you a fairly short answer because I actually wrote a book on this subject. It's called What's Happened to Politics. It's available in used bookstores everywhere across, <laughs> across the country. What's happened? But you get a, well, I can't give you a free copy because, I mean, I have to make a living. But it 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 it, it uh, talks about these forces that are at work. Politics has become um, uh, there's too much sloganeering. There's too much. There's too little communication. There's there's too little um, conversation. I mean, what I like about the potential for minority government is that you can actually encourage a conversation. What I don't like about what's happened so far since the election is that the conversation still hasn't started. Maybe in private the leaders are talking, but I mean, you've now got a situation where people come out of the meeting and say, well, I didn't do this, I didn't do that, and then that's the end of it, you know, goodbye. And you sort of say, that, that really doesn't get you very far. You've got to have a conversation. So I worry about that. I worry about regionalism. Um, and I worry about the, the, the forces of regionalism and, and, and feeding on each other. And, and, for example, the province is saying, well, I'm not getting my share. I've never been at a premier's meeting where a premier said, I got everything I need. I don't need any. Like, I'm fine. Don't. Can I give you something? No, that doesn't, that doesn't happen. So we now have this is exaggerated now to the point where everyone's saying, you owe me. You know, you know Alberta's saying, you owe me. Uh, and Saskatchewan saying, don't do this. You don't. Quebec saying, well, we, you know, we have our position. Ontario, you know, you, and this is not healthy as a culture. At some point, people have to say, what do we owe each other here? What's, what's the fair way to, to, to run the country? Uh, and uh, yeah, equalization is a very important symbol of solidarity. Um, before I, you know, I could, I could give a talk, whole talk on how unfairly, I've talked to Tom Cruchet about this, how unfairly Ontario was treated uh, during our recession in 1990. It was brutal. And the federal government was not there in the same way it had been there at one time. And, you know, you, you, you gotta, you, you gotta understand, it, it, in, in times of economic difficulty, it's never a perfect system to, to, to deal with it. But you do have to figure out how to, how to deal with it. But I, I am concerned about it. But I, on another level, I'm very confident in the, in the resilience of Canada. I, I, I'm, I'm not pessimistic about the country at all. So we have 
brief uh, return to Slido. You may have already addressed some of these questions, but I'll, uh, um, thoughts on Mr. Scheer touting of his being the largest minority government with regard to your comment, there's no such thing as a strong minority. And I might add, since you may have addressed that, uh, you already talked about PharmaCare. The next one down, do you find that coalition governments that share power often have minority, single issue parties that are given a disproportionate amount of power? And you can it, it respond can, to those two as you see. It, it, it can have, well, yeah, you know, look, look, I understand Andrew Shear's frustration. He did get, he did get most votes across the country. But this is not the first time this has happened. Uh, in Quebec, uh, it was frequently the case that the Liberal Party would win more uh, votes. Mr. Charre, once when he lost his election, uh, he won more votes. Um, but they were in the wrong place. <laughs> and uh, other people got more votes in the right place, and so they, they won. Um, when when um, Daniel Johnson beat uh, Jean Lesage, which was not anticipated in the, in a, the election after you know, Mr. Lesage's you know, great, quiet revolution government, and he was defeated, um, Mr. Lesage got more votes, way more votes than Daniel Johnson. But Daniel Johnson got more seats. He got rural seats, and Jean Lesage had big vote majorities built up in the city, so he, so he, didn't, he didn't win. So it happens. Stuff happens. Um, Mr. Scheer's problem is that he didn't win the votes where he absolutely needed to win them. And he didn't win them in the GTA, in the broader area known as the Golden Horseshoe. He did not win. And I was surprised he, he, he didn't do better. I thought he would do better in that area. I, you know, I wasn't sure what the result was going to be at the end, like everybody else. But I, I, I felt, you know, it's pretty, go to, you know, suburbia. But on the other hand, you go to suburbia now, it's changing. It's changing very fast. And uh, it's, 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 uh, I think that's what Mr. Shear faced. So, you know, too bad. And you can say, you know, uh, <coughs> I, I live in the tallest building in Topeka, Kansas. So what? It's not, the, that's not the point. The point is, you know, you, you've got to win the election. It, it's not, it's, it's, what, it's what happens. Well, on that deep point. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I want to, on your behalf... Professors always had problems with me. <laughs> I want to, on your behalf, uh, thank Mr. Ray for coming and for his, his thoughts and, for, and wish him well in his future in stand-up comedy. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Thank you. And some swag. What? I'm going to see what it is. Huh? A water, water bottle. Uh, we want you to take it into the monk school every yeah, day. I will, I will. Well, I need it to take my medicine during the day. <laughs> ah, this is good because I actually had a copy of Tom's book, Tom Crochane's book, uh, but it's been, it's been taken from my office by somebody else, so I'm glad to have another copy. This is a very, very good book by Professor Crochane. Um, it, it's groundbreaking in many respects. Uh, it puts a focus on the, on the real condition of indigenous people, and it looks creatively at what some of the solutions might be. Uh, and like Tom has always done, he thinks for himself, and he thinks outside the box. It's a it's very good book. And I, I highly recommend it to my students, and I appreciate very much having a, having a copy. Again, okay. thank you. Well, you know the weirdest question I